Welcome everyone. I'm Grace Korea Kanja in Nairobi and this is Africa Matters. As the civil war in Sudan enters its second year, the United Nations estimates that one in five people no longer have a place they can call home. They've been forced to flee for their lives several times within Sudan or to neighboring countries, creating the largest displacement crisis in the world. Civilians are fleeing intense fighting between the Sudanese armed forces under the command of General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and the paramilitary rapid support forces headed by General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti. They're battling for control of the capital Khartoum, for Darfur and other parts of the country. Human rights groups accuse the two warring factions of using explosive weapons in urban areas, bombing civilian targets and hospitals. They also accuse them of killing more than 15,000 people since April last year, as well as committing rape and looting. Momen al Maki reports from Port Sudan on what daily life has now become for millions across the country. Twelve months of war have changed the lives of millions of Sudanese people, especially those are living in hot areas in Khartoum, Darfur, and the Kurdufans. Many markets have been destroyed, and people right now are living in very severe conditions, and they cannot provide food and shelter. Those who took refuge here in Port Sudan are facing with major difficulties such as inflation and the storing prices of food. Some areas, especially in Gazira state and war-affected areas, access to food has become very difficult. For me as a citizen coming from Khartoum, every day I find exaggerated increases. This center you see used to be a school, but the authorities here in Port Sudan have transferred it into a refugee center. This center, as you can see, uh, right now is full of uh, displaced and refugees. More than 105 are living inside this refugee center. The conditions of the displaced and refugees have been also affected as the ongoing war caused the largest displacement crisis the world has ever witnessed. Displacing 11 million Sudanese internally and externally which pretends a humanitarian and health catastrophe that threatens their lives. The hopes of the Sudanese who lived the scourge of the war do not hesitate to call for peace. But it seems that these hopes have been defeated by both warring factions. Of course, we all call for peace. We all call for peace because we want stability in the country in the end. We want to be able to bring Sudan to the point where it was before the war and make it better. Despite the international community efforts and the political parties, war remains the only option for the Sudanese people. Nearly 1.8 million Sudanese people have fled to neighboring countries, according to UN's refugee agency, UNHCR, risking regional and economic stability. Like in South Sudan, where refugees who had fled past conflicts are now returning home, but finding its economic backbone, oil exports through Sudan have been severely disrupted by the conflict. Tens of thousands of Sudanese refugees have also ended up in Ethiopia and the Central African Republic. And both Egypt and Chad are hosting about half a million refugees, despite the fact that N'Djamena has also declared its own food emergency. Brenda Radido reports. These families are fleeing and making their way to Chad. Many traumatized, having witnessed war in Darfur, where there are mass killings, rapes, and widespread destruction. Those left behind wake up not to the call of prayer, but to the sound of gunfire. Yusuf Omar escaped with his family from El Jaina, West Sudan, to Chad's refugee camp in January. They shot and killed many of us and took all our belongings. They left us with absolutely nothing apart from the clothes on our backs. They took everything from our cart and all our food supplies. 
The fighting between the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces has caused a humanitarian crisis. 25 million people need humanitarian assistance, including food and clean water. 18 million people are facing acute hunger, with nearly 2 million people already on the brink of starvation. 11 million people have been uprooted from their homes since the conflict began. And 1.7 million people have fled to five neighboring countries. Aid agencies are struggling to cope with the thousands who arrive every day seeking shelter and safety in South Sudan and Chad refugee camps. Two aid convoys crossed the border to reach the full earlier this month. They are the first WFP trucks since February after authorities in Port Sudan closed the humanitarian corridors from neighboring Chad. Several talks brokered by Saudi Arabia, the United States and the regional bloc Igad, plus an Egyptian initiative, have all failed to bring the warring parties to the negotiating table. Turkey and Libya also offered to mediate indirect talks. In early March, the UN adopted a resolution calling for a Ramadan ceasefire, but the cessation of hostilities was ignored. Nearly a year since this crisis began, the situation in Sudan remains catastrophic and it is only getting worse. Right now, just 5% of the UN's humanitarian appeal for Sudan has been met. Already, the World Food Programme has had to cut assistance to over 7 million people in Chad and South Sudan. In many cities, whole neighborhoods have been reduced to rubble. And all the while, millions face hunger and violence as the worst displacement crisis globally continues and the world looks the other way. Brenda Radido, Africa Matters. Aid agencies are now struggling to raise the more than $4 billion needed to respond to the unprecedented humanitarian crisis that's unfolding both in Sudan and its neighbors. Let's hear more from Abdallah Hussein, the NSF operations manager in Kenya. He joins me here in Nairobi. Hello, sir. Thank you so much for having us. So let's get straight into it, sir, and talk about what is making the situation in Sudan particularly urgent compared to other ongoing conflicts worldwide. Well, uh, what's making the situation in Sudan um, uh, urgent is that it is um, a neglected humanitarian crisis. It's one year on since the armed conflict has started. Uh, it had a huge impact on the civilian population. Uh, today you have 8.4 million uh, displaced uh, population and 6.5 of, of that population is displaced internally within, uh, within Sudan. The humanitarian aid is insufficient. Uh, it is today uh, we see what my colleagues on the ground refer to as humanitarian deserts because the, most of the aid groups uh, who used to provide assistance in, uh, in, the, in the country, especially in the Darfur region, left in the month of April in 2023. Let's get into specifics and mm -hmm. talk about the most urgent needs for both the IDPs and the Sudanese refugees and just why is aid access an issue? Well, to start with the, the humanitarian uh, insufficient, especially food, it's, it's a catastrophic on the ground. To give you an example, we work in North Darfur in the camp of Zamzam, which is like 300,000 people in a camp. Uh, we did an assessment in the month of January we found that the 25% of the children under five years are malnourished, uh, and 7% seven of, seven of them were ac uh, severely acute malnutrition, because, which is a condition which is almost on the brink of death if there is no uh, medical intervention. So this is the situation we see. And the last distribution in that camp, for example, was in the month of May, so 10 months, no food distribution for a population that depended on, on aid, uh, food aid uh, in that particular area. So that's, that's a part of the assistance. So this is a massive gap. And what we have on MSF, is, of course, is scaling up. It's a drop in the ocean. We need more other actors to be on the ground. And the question of the access is difficult because the, the permits and visas and the system is so centralized in Port Sudan that for any aid actor to access in the affected regions, in Khartoum and Darfur, uh, Darfur region, they must go to uh, Port Sudan to get a permit. And it takes for a visa for one month. So four, four weeks for waiting for a visa. So how would a permanent ceasefire affect the delivery of aid? And is there a chance that it could happen anytime soon? Well, I hope that it happens. Uh, 
uh, for sure it, it's up to the war inside to, and they have a responsibility in the, under international humanitarian law to allow the humanitarian aid, protection of civilians is part of their obligations. And I really hope that, they, that there is consideration for the civilian population that suffered for one year now. Let's talk about the donor conference that is planned for April 15th in Paris. So what will happen to civilians if it fails to raise the aid money that is needed? Well, uh, for me, it's, uh, it, I, I think it's, uh, Sudan deserves an attention. It's, uh, as I said, uh, neglected in, the, in terms of feasibility. The scale of what's happening and the attention it gets are not proportionate. And I hope that there is, a, there is a more attention and more mobilization, particularly on the ground. I think that, um, that uh, all international community, whether it's African or North African, have a responsibility to come uh, to respond to the humanitarian crisis in Sudan. And uh, it's not only within the country, it's also the region, because you have uh, uh, half a million people in Chad, in the refugees, that are also uh, facing a gap in funding and that MSF has been highlighting recently. But you also have uh, half a million people, majority of them South Sudanese, who are going to South Sudan and put on a lot of pressure. So the, the crisis in Sudan is within the country very dire, but it's also have a regional implications. Staying in the region, we go to the Central African Republic. It's been five years since the country signed a peace deal with 14 rebel groups. But ex-combatants say it's difficult to do something other than fight in a nation where there's little to no work, as Tiber Aydin reports. The Central African Republic is rich in gold and diamonds, yet it's still on its knees, having seen conflict for what seems like a lifetime. The International Monetary Fund ranks it as the third poorest country in the world, with nearly 70% of its people living in extreme poverty. Almost a decade ago, the government took over the UN's disarmament program that encourages rebel groups to lay down their weapons. Carol is one of the nearly 5,000 ex-fighters that gave up their arms to forge a better life. She works at a market and makes clothes with a sewing machine she received during reintegration training. But she can barely support her three children. During the crisis in 2013, Seleka rebels killed my father and mother. That's what pushed me to fight. Over four years I saw so many bad things. At the point I witnessed people being decapitated and that made me want to leave. I'm asking the government to come and help us. We receive a lot of training, but even with the training it's still not easy to make money. 42-year-old Wilson Kudengere is just another former fighter that took advantage of the nationwide program after years of fighting for various groups. I've been part of armed groups for more than 10 years. I started in Bambari and I joined Ali Darasa's group. I was part of the group that chased out President Bozizi. In 2017 conflict between Muslims and Christians, I fought for the Muslim side. After that, I joined the demobilization process, wanting to become a soldier. But unfortunately, the government took some of us and reintegrated the rest into civilian life. Now, I'm still in Boa, doing nothing. The program's main purpose is to give fighters hope. But it's hard to believe in a brighter future when there are few viable job options available. Taiba Aydin, Africa Matters. The United Nations says about 26.5 million people in Nigeria don't have enough to eat due to worsening security challenges, rising farmer harder clashes and the impact of the climate crisis. But a new report shows a different kind of threat. Farmers are being forced to pay huge levies to armed gangs before they are allowed to grow food. Timothy Obiezu reports from Kaduna State. <laughs> More than 5,000 internally displaced farmers live in Marbarido, where the stakes for survival couldn't be higher. Armed bandits attack remote villages, demanding unrealistic levies for protection. Those who refuse to pay suffer the consequences, like Elisha Bowers, 35-year-old son, murdered while collecting firewood on April 4th. My son died looking for what to eat with his family. The two people that went with him escaped and ran away, but the bandits burned their motorcycles. At my age, how do I take care of his four children? 
Firewood has become the life support for many here who were forced to abandon their communities and farmlands after frequent gang attacks and demands. Bauer's brother says his family fled their village three years ago, no longer able to cope. They come to our site, face. They say, may give them 10 million. And we don't get 10 million. We can't fight, 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 fight. We can't get 5 million, give them. They say, may we stay, we will farm again. We start farming. The rain season, the harvesting time, they say we will give them again 10 million. And that thing where we farm, now so we carry them all, sir. But fleeing the bandits hasn't improved the farmers' lives and it's had a trickle down effect. There was actually an increase in the production of food. But this increase did not reflect in the price of food because farmers have to factor in those amounts they have paid to the bandits. And in that addition, factor in other logistics. Nigerian security consulting firm SBM released a report in March saying local farmers across five states in northwest and central Nigeria have paid at least $108,000 worth of farm levies imposed by bandits since 2020. Here in Chukun local government area, residents have paid at least $9,000 to armed bandits, according to a report by SB Morgan Intelligence. While the gangs operate mostly unhindered, food insecurity is pushing many here into a corner. The United Nations says rising costs have pushed some 26.5 million people in the country into food insecurity, up from 18 million last year. Nigeria is also facing its worst economic crisis in years, which has been exacerbated by government reform policies. But last month, the government announced grain distribution to all states and is now considering establishing state police units to combat the gang violence. Government should come to our help. Because if today government refuses to do anything, where they think is safe, may not be safe tomorrow. We have not seen any intervention of anyone challenging them, which that made them to operate the way they like. Many here say it's only a matter of time before the vicious cycle repeats itself. Timothy Obiezu, Africa Matters, Chikung, Kaduna State, Nigeria. To East Africa now, where a new initiative is trying to solve a global problem. The UN says around 13% of food produced in the world is lost before it even reaches the market. Nearly half of the vegetables and fruit grown on the continent never reaches the market, and that number is significantly higher in some African countries, putting pressure on farmers' incomes, food security, and the environment. In Kenya, Anne Masharia visited a startup in the capital, Nairobi, that's hoping to change that one veggie at a time. Drought is an annual challenge in Kenya, but this bustling market tell a tale of resilience. Hidden beneath their vibrancy is a sobering reality. Nearly half of the region's fruits and vegetables never make it to the market, according to Greenpeace Africa. Despite Kenya's struggle with drought and food security, a digital revolution is underway. Meet Food Cloud, a platform that not just changing the game, but rewriting the rules all together. My vision is cutting food loss by 40 to 60 percent in the next five years. This will, it will enable more communities that are in need, get affordable and nutritious food at a very good rate, uh, elevating the issue of hunger and, and, uh, and uh, malnutrition in Kenya. Imagine a world where surplus produce doesn't go to waste, but becomes a lifeline for those in need. That's what this platform is aiming for. First, we have a system for farmers. It's called Red Site. The farmer or the vendor register on the system. Then my admin on that, they approve on what has been registered. That's the farmer. The consumer on the other end eh, checks on the product has, has been uh, discounted on, on, the, on the prices. Eh. Then he orders. Then food crowd on the other end delivers this product, discounted product to the consumer in time. Food Cloud collaborates with 100,000 farmers out of Kenya's 7.5 million smallholder farmers.
to combat food waste and hunger. Despite facing policy hurdles, it offers tailored support to helping less tech-savvy farmers and redistributes surplus produce to vulnerable communities. By making it available, by making food available, by bringing access to food to the poor and the common person, then automatically you're working and increasing and improving nutrition even at household level. At the Ukulima market, Vice Chairman Peter Njoroge says the collaboration between traders and food cloud has reduced waste by 10%. The challenge is that uh, they are selling at a throwing price. They are selling at a loss so that they can save some money. But if they had placed in cold rooms, they would have sold it at a good price. The Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that 1.3 billion tons of food are wasted annually, globally. So every effort to reduce that counts. In this digital oasis, the seeds of compassion flourish, bridging a gap between scarcity and abundance. As food cloud thrives, so does the spirit of unity, proving that even in the harshest climate, humanity can cultivate hope and harvest change. Anne Masharia, Africa Matters, Nairobi. Speaking of cultivating hope, we head to Somalia next, where food insecurity has worsened due to years of conflict droughts and floods. Young farmers are trying to tackle the situation with modern farming methods. They are now using greenhouses to help grow food all year round and feed people in the capital Mogadishu. Elias Avchu brings us that story. On the outskirts of Mogadishu, these greenhouses signal hope and innovation. Filled by the vision of young entrepreneurs and the need for food security, Somalia's farmers or embracing new methods. The idea to consistently supply fresh produce to the markets arose in 2014. We were young, had studied agriculture, and had just graduated. Initially, we focused on landscaping, planting trees in hotel, houses, and public spaces. However, we observed that most of the vegetables consumed in Mogadishu were imported from abroad. This drove us to venture into smart agriculture, utilizing greenhouses and irrigation systems. Our aim was to provide produce to the market throughout the year. Somalia has struggled to grow crops in the face of droughts, floods and insecurity. But now, greenhouses are enabling the cultivation of fruits and vegetables for local consumption. It marks a significant step towards self-sufficiency and reduced the need for imported food. The youth who initiated modern farming have made significant contributions to our country. By planting fresh produce within our borders, they have not only created job opportunities for themselves, but have also met public demand. In the past, even basic vegetables like cucumbers and tomatoes were imported, causing unreliable logistical problems and added expenses for the business sector. The success of greenhouse farming can be seen in Mogadishu supermarkets where customers can purchase local fresh fruit and vegetables. The shift not only boosts food security, but also instills a sense of pride and trust in homegrown produce. And on top for that, I'm extremely satisfied knowing that these vegetables were produced in our country. First and foremost, they are organic, fresh and healthy. Knowing that they come from our local farms makes us feel secure. Young agricultural graduates like Mohamed Mahdi are pleased with the opportunities greenhouse farming provides. I'm grateful to be among the graduates who studied agriculture and thrilled that the companies behind these new greenhouse businesses have created job opportunities for us. As young people, we make up 75% of the Somali population, and given the high unemployment rate in the country, we are grateful for the chance to work in our chosen field of expertise. Somalia currently imports 80% of the fruit and vegetables it needs. These greenhouses will help cultivate not only local crops, but homegrown talent as well. Ilyas Avju, Africa Matters. And finally this week, we explore a well in South Sudan. It's a city known as one of the most peaceful in the country, and this adds to its economic and social vibrancy.
our show this week. Let us know of what you think about the stories you've seen. Share your ideas and feedback. You can find us on X and on YouTube by searching TRT World Africa Matters. Thanks for watching and it's goodbye from me, Grace Kuriakanja in Nairobi.